Whether the kids admit it or not, sixth grade through eighth grade, they're on the internet, usually on their phones. Computers are something they use every day, and they don't really think about it. Now it's who has information about them, who they're giving information to, who they're sending information to. Places they're going they don't expect to, that they get rerouted or people get information about them, and they just don't know those things. I didn't realize that you could get in so much trouble for the things that you could do online. Welcome to our special about internet safety. During this broadcast, you're going to hear a lot of online safety information for kids, and everyone's going to get a chance to apply these uh, tips in various ways to secure your devices and online information. My name is Jeff Taylor, and I'm excited to be here to present this, uh, this uh, online content. And I'm here with my colleague, Vanessa Carrasco, to present expert advice on how to safely navigate this in this challenging, connected digital world. We work for a cybersecurity technology company, McAfee, and it's now part of Intel Security. And I'm a program manager working with expert engineers who really strive to protect your devices and stay one step ahead of the hackers. This segment is based on our McAfee uh, for Online Safety for Kids program, and it's my pleasure to introduce Vanessa, who helps run this program. Thanks, Jeff. As a global leader in cybersecurity technology, we've made it our priority at McAfee to educate the public in safe internet practices. I'm fortunate enough to work with employee volunteers all around the world who go out to schools and local youth organizations to teach people of all ages uh, how to protect their personal information and maintain um, and make safe decisions online. As Jeff said, we're going to go through a few of the latest apps. Uh, we'll talk about how to protect your devices and personal information. We'll discuss cyberbullying, and we'll offer you some expert tips. Now, what do you say we jump in and see what kids are doing online? Perfect. Let's get started. Welcome to their world. Now, kids, teens, and college students out there will recognize a lot of these applications, giving you venture into the latest and greatest that technology has to offer. Now, parents and later generations of adults that may not venture as much, but it's most important that you really gain a high-level understanding of these popular apps. You need to make informed safety decisions in your digital lives. Now, according to a study McAfee conducted in 2013 called Digital Deceptions, we revealed that just about 95% of youth have at least one social media account, most of which are accessed through mobile phones and tablets. We'll go through a few of the most popular social applications, the first of which is Vine. Now, when you download Vine to any of your devices, you'll see a green V icon. Vine allows users to upload short seven and a half second videos that loop continuously. And while most of the videos that are uploaded are innocent in nature, some of them do contain adult content. Uh, in fact, Vine requests users to confirm that they're 17 years of age or older. Which brings us to an important topic. Most apps nowadays have age restrictions, which many people think of as suggested or recommended ages, similar to a PG-13 movie. Now, it's not quite the same with apps. If a child is lying about his or her age to download an app, that child is essentially circumventing federal laws such as COPA, which have been put in place to protect them. All right, these ages, age uh, divisions are very important. Now, the next three applications we'll review have a policy of 13 years and older. Snapchat, with this pic ghost icon, is an application that allows users to send pictures or snaps that actually disappear from the recipient's de device after a specified amount of time. So I could take a picture and send it to my friend, and after 10 seconds that I set, it'll actually disappear. Unfortunately, this has a, a misperception that lends itself to sharing of inappropriate content, right? And it's important to know that there's actually some loopholes to save these screenshots permanently just with the built-in operating system function, which reminds us how easily it is for this online content to really become permanent. And these last two apps that you see, you probably recognize they've been around for quite some time. Instagram allows users to upload pictures and videos to share with their followers. Twitter allows users to upload very short messages called tweets. Um, and it's important to note that while these apps weren't intended to uh, spread inappropriate content, they're not really dangerous in and of themselves. Their widespread use has made it much easier for people, including children, to access inappropriate content and share too much information. Right, these social apps can really go viral or, or public. So we just we need to be really careful about what we share online. So now what we'd like to do is show you a video called Photo Fake created by NetSmart and it really highlights the fact that once you send and post something to the internet, it's really out of your hands and out of your control.
I heard it was too many. Check this out. Yo, what up? Whoa! Oh man! Yo, send that to me real quick. I'm not gonna. Come on, send that to me. Yo, you Look at that, boys. Check that out, boys. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 I, I got oh, I oh, had to send oh, this to Mark. Send that out now. Oh, It's really surprising how quickly one picture can end up in the hands of family, friends, and strangers, isn't it? I mean, it really touches on this concept of actually sexting. Now, sexting is the sending of sexually graphic photographs from one person to another's electronic mobile device. Now, of course, with children, this is illegal. Right, and we saw in the photo fate video um, a young girl who took what we can assume to have been an inappropriate picture, and we saw how quickly, Jeff, as you mentioned, that picture go viral. Now, it's important to, to think about here that although this girl was possibly opening up herself to bullying among her peers, what's even scarier is that she could be charged with the distribution of child pornography. Parents, it is critical for you to understand the legal consequences of something like sexting in your state. To be totally clear, here in California, if you send a sexually explicit photo of anyone under the age of 18, even if it's of yourself, it could be considered the distribution of child pornography and could be punished by law. Thanks, Vanessa. Now, to be fair, we see a lot of similar oversharing mistakes with adults. So we encourage everyone to stay until the end because we're going to review some action plans for folks to help avoid these disasters. Now, teens, it's time for us to talk to your parents for a while about what's going on. So let's jump in. Now, McAfee conducted another study in the U.S. called D The Digital Divide, which refers to the disconnect between what parents believe their kids are doing online and what they're actually doing. What we found is that nearly 50% of parents believe that they know everything their child does on the internet. In contrast, just over 70% of kids admittedly hide their online behavior from their parents. Right, and consider that one quarter spend five to six hours per day online, and parents actually believe it's closer to one to two hours. Look, as a parent, I know how easy it is to lose track of my child on the computer. There's tablets, there's screens all around the house, right? But this is a perfect example of the digital divide. And it's actually a common parent and youth disconnect regarding online behavior. Now, it's a logical question for parents to ask, how does something like this even happen? Well, this same study revealed the top three ways that teens are, in fact, hiding their online behavior. As you can see, the number one way is by clearing their browser history. Parents, you probably know that your children know how to get into the computer settings um, as well as, if not better than we do. So it's very important for you to look through that browser history um, and not feel like you're peering into a private journal. In fact, that browser history is a tool that allows you to make sure that your child isn't diving into any illegal or dangerous content. If your child is in fact clearing that history, um, it could be because he or she is embarrassed or ashamed to talk about it. Uh, so we encourage you to open up the lines of communication. Let kids know about the risks to their personal safety and that of their devices, and hopefully that'll persuade them to make uh, more wise decisions on the internet. Yes, and there's many methods actually to help prevent deleting of this history, but it's key to really have this open line of communication. That's critical. Now, the second and third methods are pretty straightforward. You know, the child will close the browser after the parent walks in. Quite simple. 
or they just delete the instant messaging content or whatever content that they know is not acceptable. Right? As a parent, though, I'm really concerned about the online behavior and really it leads, and what it can really lead to, these long-term legal, educational, and career problems. Now, the legal implications of our online behavior are pretty clear, but the personal impacts related to our privacy and our personal information can be somewhat less understood. So we prepared a scenario we call Connecting the Digital Dots, which shows how just a few personal details that we might share in a survey or an online form can lead to misuse. Connecting the digital dots demonstrates what a devious person might discover, again, with just a few data points. And understanding this scenario will hopefully lead you to making better decisions. Very good. We'll get started here. Connecting the digital dots. The story begins with the day of shopping and fun. You know, you, of course, you're greeted with a smile by a, by a survey taker who offers you a prize, of course, if you fill out the survey and get selected. Um, this scenario can also occur online. It's just very common. And what they're asking for is personal information. You provide your name, your address, and your email. And of course, this feels justified because you, know, you need to be notified if you win the prize. Right, and we've all been there, right? It seems innocent enough. We figure the worst that can happen is we might be added to some advertisement list and receive some spam. But what's important to remember here is that in this highly connected world, um, internet searches have made it very easy to find out more. And we may be, in fact, giving vendors the ability to do a lot more than that. And what we say is what happens if this information ends up, uh, the survey ends up in the hands of a criminal? Uh, the criminal usually searches with your email address just as a starter and they could on your find your Facebook public profile picture for example or the other information that you have public. They could search other social sites and they really f take a personal information summary of you and of course in extreme cases they can violate your privacy and commit identity theft uh, against your name. So we have a few suggestions, one being uh, the least of which is to provide the minimal amount of information, like your physical address should clearly be optional in these surveys, right? A second suggestion that we have is to create a secondary junk email that's not connected. We have no digital dots. There's no ties with this junk mail. And if you fill out a survey, you would use that junk mail. Now your primary email address, of course, you list on your banks and your social media sites. Exactly. Now, connecting the digital dots helps us understand the sensitivity of our personally identifiable information. But I do want to spend some time talking about how we may be inadvertently oversharing. Did you know that phones with cameras can automatically record the exact location of where you were when you took that picture? This feature, called geotagging, is made possible by the GPS, or Global Pos Positioning System, that comes standard in most gadgets today. Now, once a geotagged photo is shared or posted, anyone who sees that picture can also see the longitude and latitude coordinates of where you were when you took that picture. Now, this doesn't sound like such a big deal, unless, of course, you're taking pictures at your home or, say, at your child's school. Agreed. So we'd like to show you how to turn this off right now with a quick walkthrough. We're going to demonstrate Apple and Android operating system and the settings to turn this off. Now these operating systems come out with user interface and operating system updates. However, these settings are fairly consistent in terms of uh, where you go locate and turn them off. So first we have here are, is the Apple. Um, you just go straight into settings, into privacy, and you find the location settings and there's a toggle switch. This toggle switch is on the camera and you see here in this example that it's turned off. Now, Jeff, I have a question for you. Sure. Sometimes I want my phone to know where I am. So is it okay to allow some of these apps to access my location? Yeah, that's a good question. So in this example, you, your map, your G Google map, for example, on this screen, you need to turn it on for it to actually function properly. So this next one we'll go over is the Android. And this is a little different. You actually have to go into the camera. And from there, there's a gear icon representing your settings. You dive right into the camera options and you'll find geotag listed there on, in the uh, settings. Great. So parents really need to be checking out their child's settings to make sure that it's appropriate for, uh, for what they should be using the phone for. It's a great tip. Hopefully you can all do that right away. Now I do want to pause and switch gears just a little bit and discuss passwords. Most of us have several accounts online, maybe online banking, an email address, several social media accounts. I, I'd like to ask you all, is it the same password that you use for each of these accounts? And if so, how complex is your password? 
You might be surprised to know that studies show that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in sequence is among the most common passwords, right up there with the word password itself. Um, if you're serious about your online safety and the safety of your devices and personal information, there are some tips that we have regarding passwords. The first of which is you want to make sure that those codes are long, um, at least eight characters. Make sure they are complex, which means they mix upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols and that they are unique. You want to try to avoid recycling any old passwords and try to have a unique password for every account that you have. And remember, your goal is to make it difficult for anyone to guess, especially the bad guys. You don't want to use a single word from the dictionary as an example. What we like to do is think of a long, easy to remember phrase, such as a favorite movie or, or a song. In this example, um, you just take the first letter of each word and to make it even more secure, you can swap numbers or symbols. You know, for example, if I was to write this on a piece of paper, I could just write down the movie phrase and nobody would truly know what my password was. Great tip. At the end, what you get doesn't even resemble a word. Now you can do the same thing with names and other simple words. As long as you're mixing those letters and numbers and symbols, um, you should be fine. Even a short word like MASH, the television show, can be made much more complex by swapping out some of those letters with symbols. In this highly connected digital world, it should be no surprise that criminals want to take full advantage that we rely so heavily on our devices. Whether you're banking, playing video games, or socializing, you need to be aware of the common security threats that are out there. So we're going to go over a few of those today. Right, and the first is malware. Malware in general refers to software programs that are designed to damage or take some other unwanted action on your computer or mobile device. Viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and spyware are among the most common, you might have heard of them, and they can harm your hardware, which can lead to really pricey fixes on your devices, or they can track and steal your personal information. So it's very important to install a good firewall and a good security software package. Um, but do remember that cyber criminals are getting very smart and they're targeting mobile devices uh, much more frequently. So make sure that you've got a passcode set on every one of your mobile devices as well as antivirus software for each of those. Very good. Now we're also hearing a lot about scams on the internet and they come in different forms. A lot of them are from pop-up ads offering free prizes to legitimate looking emails and all, all of them asking for your personal information of course. You need to be just overly cautious about pop-up ads. Don't open up emails and, and click those links and attachments. If it's a friend or, or if it's from a friend or a family member and it seems kind of fishy, best thing to do is just to call them. Now, I've received an email before asked from my bank asking me to change my password. In this example, I wouldn't click the email from the, the link from the email. I would just go straight to the browser, type in my bank's homepage, and from there, I would, I would just bypass that link altogether in a, a safer way to access and change your passwords. Now, I'm sure we've all been in situations where we need to connect away from home, perhaps at a coffee house, an airport, a hotel, etc. Uh, oftentimes, these places offer a free Wi-Fi connection. It's important for you to know these are unsecured networks, and hackers can easily use something called a wireless sniffer to capture your information and data as it's sent back and forth across that network. Now, truthfully, it's pretty hard to tell, if not impossible, the secure public networks from the bad ones. So the safest thing you can do is avoid them altogether. Uh, but if you must connect, make sure you're not conducting any personal business or sharing any personal information across that network. If you're one of our more advanced users, you might want to shop around for what we call a virtual private network, or VPN. Or if you're a mobile user, just opt for using your mobile data plan to connect. Yes. Now the Internet can be very impersonal, and as a result, we can say things very quickly to too many people, and this is very common with cyberbullying, which we'd like to talk about right now. Cyberbullying is when someone repeatedly harasses and taunts somebody, another person, over the Internet. So we'd like to show you a short video that explores what does it look like when a cyberbully is brazen enough to do this face-to-face -face as opposed to hiding behind a keyboard. So let's take a look. Megan. Hey, Jessica. Megan, you're a tramp. Ryan Fitch told me you guys made out. Everybody knows. He said your breast smells like garbage, and he almost puked. He says you're the most desperate girl he knows, besides your mom. 
How many boyfriends does she have anyway? Lots? Your makeup makes you look like a clown. That zit is huge, zit face. Ugly. Wow, that really sounds different uh, when it's said face to face, doesn't it? Um, now, there are legal ramifications for cyberbullying that vary from state to state. Parents can be fined, depending on the situation. Children can be suspended or even expelled from school. And this sort of mark on someone's record can really follow them into their future with regard to college and career options. Obviously, there are two sides to each cyberbullying story, so it's equally important for you to look for signs that your child may be a victim of this kind of crime. For example, if he or she appears uneasy after reading an email or text message uh, or withdraws from friends and family. So Vanessa, you work with students on a regular basis through the online Safety for Kids program. What advice do you give students and parents in these situations? You know, it's difficult to say. Every case is different. Uh, but in general, we, we like to tell kids to stop, block, and tell. And what that means is stop communication with the bully altogether. You never forward or respond uh, to a bully's message. Uh, you block that person from your communications list. Sometimes that means you've got to boot them out of your video game. Um, and you tell an adult immediately. Parents, if your child approaches you and mentions that you know, they're experiencing cyberbullying, you want to get the school involved immediately because as we mentioned, it is a crime and it chances are it's probably not the first time it's happened at that school. Excellent advice. Now we're reaching our end of time, but we would really like to reiterate some very important messages and leave you with some action plans that we've been promising you. Uh, there's some simple things that we can really do today for you and your family to stay safer on the internet. So we'd like to take a look and go over these action plans right now. now. One of the most important things you can do is purchase antivirus protection software for all of your devices. We mean laptops, computers, tablets, and phones. Keep in mind that third-party antivirus software is rated far above some of the free built-in security products you might find. The reason for this is obvious, it's their sole purpose to protect you. Also, all operating systems, whether you're running Microsoft or Apple, uh, conduct regular security updates. We recommend opting for the automatic updates as they're pretty convenient and they ensure that you're getting the correct updates. I also want to add that apps on your devices will update regularly too. Make sure you're enabling those automatic updates. Yeah, it's a very common thing. I would get my application and I would say manual, I'll do it myself. Automatic is always the way to go. Now knowing your apps is very key and critical here. Applications have a lot of things to consider. You have access rights to the various functions on your phone. There's reputation with apps. There's age and there's privacy concerns. So when you download an app, it asks you, what do you want to give this application access to on your phone? So your map, for example, as we talked about, it's going to ask for the GPS. Can, do you want to give your phone GPS access to your phone or not? This makes sense. It's a map you would give access to the phone. However, if you're playing a video game and it's asking for your location, if it's asking for your camera, your contact list, your photos, it doesn't really make sense. And as a parent, you really want to pay attention to what it's asking for everyone, really. App reputation is also key. Look at those reviews. Look at the data and privacy policies. Read those reviews, of course. Now, there's some third-party tools that take a closer look at app reputation that you may want to take a look at, too. Now, parents, your children will figure out which apps they want to use all on their own, but it is your job to research and understand the age advisories. Um, you want to periodically monitor how they're using their apps, and communication is, is key here. Um, make sure that you're checking that your children are not oversharing information over these social media applications, and that the people that they're interacting with are in fact people that they know and trust in real life. And one more thing, any time that you can set your profile to private, we highly recommend doing that. Great. Now, creating unique and complex passwords. We always want to create a different password for each site and make sure we change them frequently. And such as for your banking site, maybe every 90 days might be a good rule of thumb. You want to keep your personal information. This includes your home address, phone number, primary email address, private. 
Double check your public profiles on social media sites, and when possible, create aliases and fake email addresses instead of using your real ones. Also, if you've recently overshared, as some of us are guilty of doing, and you're concerned about identity theft, know that you can purchase relatively inexpensive insurance to help protect you. Excellent. And our last one is to beat cyberbullying. Just remind your kids of what they would do if they are cyberbullied online. Make sure they use that stop, block, and tell mechanism. It's, it's a great tip. Um, keep those lines of communications open with them. You want to make them feel comfortable, comfortable to, to come to you. And always report cyberbullying to the school authorities. If you would like to request an online safety presentation at a school or youth group near you, or if you'd like more information, please visit our website at www.mcafee.com forward slash online safety. Very good. You can go to that site and get a lot of content that we discussed. Just take a look. Thank you very much for joining us today. It was our pleasure, and we wish you a safe journey on the Internet. If you would like to request a free online safety presentation at a school or youth group near you, or if you would like more information, please visit our website, www.mcafee.com forward slash online safety. Here you'll find resources to help you stay one step ahead of your tech savvy kids. Please be aware that privacy policies and features for applications and websites may change as updates are made. So it's very important for you to be proactive and periodically check and review them with your children. Here are some other websites that offer useful information for protecting your family and staying web wise. www.netsmarts.org features educational resources from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for kids, teens, parents, and educators. For tips to prevent identity theft and fraud, visit www.staysafeonline.org, brought to you by the National Cyber Security Alliance. www.commonsensemedia.org is a useful resource for age-appropriate reviews of popular apps, games, and many other media-related content.